Now it's time for today's perspective. I'm going to start with a crucial question for you. Does life belong in tidy, static categories, or is it a dynamic swirl of complexities? Well, that is uh, the question at the heart of a new book that tackles the subject of every living thing. Now, it centres on the differing arguments of two men from the 18th century, one a Swedish doctor and biologist, he's, if you like, the tidy one, and a French naturalist who has more complex, swirly ways of looking at things. The book about the clash of their conflicting worldviews that's continued well, well after their deaths. The author of Every Living Thing, The Great and Deadly Race to Know All Life, uh, Jason Roberts is with me here and said his book has now been translated as well into French. It's called uh, Tout ce qui vit et respire, which translates uh, literally as everything that lives and breeze. Thanks very much for coming in. And Thank you so much. Let's talk about these two men um, first of all. We're going to start with Carl Linnaeus. He's the Swedish doctor. What did he believe? Well, Carl Linnaeus um, is probably one of the most uh, famous scientists in, in human history. Mm. And uh, he is basically uh, praised for um, uh, providing categories for all life. But not only uh, naming them, but putting them in neat um, nesting categories. Most, mm. most cool people most school children have learned the concept of kingdom, genus, phylum, uh, up to the level of species. Uh, it was a very um, complex and very um, appealing form of categorization. Unfortunately, it was built on the concept of a static creation. Uh, he lived before evolution. Uh, he actually he denied the concept of evolution. He even denied the concept of extinction. He believed that nothing had changed since the moment that God had created the earth. And that made it very possible to neatly categorize and put things away. Um, but that was the only dominant version of being able to understand life. There was a competing version as well. Yeah, this is completely different. This is Georges Louis de Buffon, uh, the French naturalist. We can see him as well behind us as we talk. Tell us about him. Well, so Georges Louis de Buffon, was the, um, basically uh, the, king's, the king's naturalist. Mm. He was the director of the uh, Jardin de Plantes here in Paris. Um, and he was an exact contemporary of Linnaeus. They were actually one of the greatest rivalries in science. They were both born in exactly the same year, 1707, and both of them devoted their lives to basically writing this giant book that would describe and essentially catalog every living thing, everything on life, on, all life on Earth. Um, both of them started the process believing that it would be a simple project of maybe five or ten years because it was impossible for there to be more than a few thousand possible species. Uh, both of them dedicated essentially the next 50 years of their life attempting to do so, and both of them failed, obviously quite utterly. And it was the reaction to why there was so much diversity that changed the different philosophies. So there are two conflicting kind of philosophies that you, you were uh, yeah. basically alluding to between complexism and, and systematics. So what gave you the idea then of talking about these two characters in this book and, and, and assessing, I suppose, their rivalry? This is an unusual book in that it is a, a dual biography, but it is also a biography that goes on uh, long after the death of both of the main characters. Mm -hmm. uh, it began as a simple biography of Linnaeus. Mm -hmm. I had uh, started the process believing that his organization of life actually reflected the natural order. Buffon was this side character that who, who had been discredited over the several centuries. It turns out that during their day, Buffon was far more famous and actually he was the best-selling non-fiction author in, in the French language history. Mm. And so as time went by, I understood the limitations of the Linnaean system of organization and understood more, quite surprisingly, that Buffon had these very advanced notions. We can see now in his writings, his very, very large 36 volumes of um, the natural history of all life, we can see many theories that were incredibly advanced for his day. Mm. He actually was one of the very first people to speculate that, uh, that the Earth, the geological time, uh, was, was something more than 4,000 years like mm. the Bible had dictated. He foresaw evolution, he believed in extinction, and he actually had a theory of, a, um, of the kind of an equivalent of DNA. 
And so he was very much in advance of his time. It was almost like a, like a da Vinci, actually. Mm. But these insights were buried within his very, very large body of work. And you don't just follow these two men, do you? You follow their supporters and what's happened since they've not been with us. Exactly. When Buffon died, like I said, he was actually one of the most famous people in the world. Linnaeus had been, had been pushed to, to one side and, and almost forgotten. And it was literally during the French Revolution and then during the Victorian expansion that the concept of Linnaeus organization started making a lot of sense for people. Mm. Because in many ways, the idea of sweeping the, the slate clean of of a um, of native of indigenous names and simply saying that I this person has discovered this species therefore we will give it a name quite often in in honor of them uh, that notion was a kind of a form of cultural colonization and so it caught on very much in the 1800s Buffon on the other hand said that it's it's arrogant to try to name a species and instead would meticulously list the different indigenous names for them. Um, they were two very different approaches. And as time went by, we understand that evolution makes the concept of static categories unnecessary. Yeah. And in fact, Charles Darwin, when he was first confronted with the work of Buffon, he responded by saying, his ideas are laughably like my own. And in the second edition of The Origin of Species, uh, Charles Darwin actually put in a little appendix giving credit to Buffon as saying he was the first person to treat the concept of evolution in a scientific fashion. This was a hundred years before, before Darwin's day. Just wanted to ask you about yourself as well. Um, I, I understand you, you left school at 14, you became a labourer, dishwasher, a DJ, <laughs> um, also worked in computing as well, didn't you? What on earth from all of that drew you into writing? Well, the, um, I, I would say basically my perspective comes from I'm never very far from the reader's perspective. Mm -hmm. And the idea of being essentially a, I don't want to say a self-educated person, but a self-curious person. Uh, I'm always, I've always been able to focus in and track down on the process of understanding. Mm -hmm. So when my readers are unfolding these very complex questions about what is the definition of life, how do we categorize things, what is DNA, um, I'm literally just one half a step ahead of them, and it's much easier to hold them by the hand in that process. What a wonderful way of looking at it. Thanks very much for coming in and uh, talking uh, to us today. Author of Every Living Thing, The Great and uh, Deadly Race to Know All Life. Also in French now, Tous ce qui vit et respire by uh, our author, uh, Jason Roberts. Thanks very much for coming in and talking Thank to you. us here on France 24.